It's noon, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. For the first years, um, how many first years we got here? Two? Uh, this is just a, a, a quick overview of everything that I'm going to go over for the next year, year and a half. I'll go over each individual section, chest, MSK for peds, but this is just to whet your appetite and for the students just to get an idea of what pediatric radiology consists of. This is the radiology motto. Radiologist's motto is A-L-A-R-A, -A, as low as reasonably achievable. This is for everybody, but it's especially true for women of childbearing age and for children. They know that there's an increased risk of childhood ALL from plain film studies, just getting an x-ray, and an increased risk of fatal breast cancer from scoliosis series. You gotta realize there's radiation-induced cataracts, but to get a radiation-induced cataract, you have, your lens has to get so much radiation over a lifetime or it won't get a radiation-induced cataract. You can get a cataract from old age, but cancers, there is no threshold. Theoretically, one study could cause a, a mutation, and the problem is the younger the patient, the longer the life expectancy. So if it caused a mutation, it's got the, this patient has a long life ahead for that mutation to turn into a cancer to kill the patient. If it happens in an 80-year-old, they're probably going to die of old age anyway, as opposed to that mutation going into a cancer to kill the patient. We also know that children's soft tissues are six to ten times more radiosensitive. So they not only have a longer life expectancy, their soft tissues are more likely to get that mutation than ours are. So we want to make sure that when uh, clinicians that you order it, it, it matters. It really is going to change something that you're going to do. Change your management. If you're going to do blah, 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 no matter what the x-ray shows, you shouldn't be ordering an x-ray. Imaging that we use in, in pediatrics X-ray is the most common order. The most commonly ordered exam in the entire world is a chest X-ray. Uh, it's quick, it's, it's cheap, it's inexpensive, it's portable, but it does use radiation. And I told you that theoretically one study could cause a mutation. Ultrasound is really good. It's more expensive than an X-ray, but it is cheap compared to CTs and MRIs. There's no radiation. As of right now, we know of no uh, harm except if you do a fetal OB ultrasound, especially when the, in the first trimester, we don't want to use power Doppler because that power can increase the temperature of the of the cells in that little developing little fetus and it could cause the, uh, the loss of the fetus. <clears throat> it's cheap, it can be portable, you can bring it by the bedside. CT is great for certain things, trauma is absolutely fantastic for. It's better than an ultrasound of the abdomen because you can miss liver lax on an ultrasound that you would never miss on a CT. But this uses a lot more radiation, and it's more expensive, but not as expensive as MRI, but it's very quick now. That's the good, that's the, the good thing and a bad thing. CT, the dose, the, the, the usage is, has skyrocketed since I was a resident, and that's because it's so fast. Spiral CT, you can go from head to toe in like a minute. And before, they would do a head, it would take probably like five minutes of scanning, and then they'd have to get the images, print them out, and the machine would have to cool down because it would get overheated if you use it too much, but now CT is so fast that everyone orders it. A CT of the chest is like equivalent to like maybe two or 300 chest x-rays. So, but if the person needs it, they need it. Even a child, if a child needs it, they need it. But if they don't need it, if you can get by with an ultrasound, if you can get by with just the x-ray, if you can get by with an MRI, that's better. And so a lot, we, I recommend a lot more MRIs than I do CTs because of the radiation. MRI is fantastic, but the problem is that they have to hold still. So in peds, they have to sedate these kids, and that causes a problem, especially the little tiny babies. They don't like to sedate them, especially if they already have respiratory problems. It does not use radiation. It uses magnetic waves and radio frequencies. It takes a lot longer. It, this study, the CT, they can be in and out quickly. MRI, they're not, there's no such thing as in and out quickly. But it's fantastic for uh, soft tissue tumors for uh, joints, for the brain, for the spine. Uh, nuclear medicine, there's definitely uh, instances you want to use nuclear medicine. This is not x-ray, this is gamma rays. The, the, we use radioactive material. It's usually injected, it can be ingested, it can be inhaled. Uh, and so the patient will be emitting these gamma rays and the gamma camera will detect it. So like if you have a patient with thyroid cancer, they give them radioactive iodine-131. These patients, need to, they will be secluded in a room and no, no visitor, especially no pregnant woman 
or any child at all because their thyroid has taken up this iodine-131 and it is giving off a lot of radiation. So if they're holding the baby or even the baby comes in the room, that baby's gonna get radiated and they will collect the urine, they will collect everything. The, the dishes, the forks, the, the plastic forks and spoons, put them all in this thing and they have to dispose of it properly. As a senior, any senior, Louise, do you know how long they, iodine-131 treatments? How long did they have to stop? Not they being, how, they're in the hospital for how long and then staying away from children and. For iodine-131. 131, iodine-131 yeah, treatment of, uh, of cancer. That's the 11th day. But it's, it's very high dose for cancer. Thyroid, thyroid cancer is high dose. You're trying to kill that cancer. You're trying to kill any metastasis, and so it's a very high dose. Fluoroscopy, we use room two, which is wonderful because it has pulse fluoroscopy. It has the floral screen last image safe technique. So in the old days, we would put our foot on the, on the floral pedal and 100% radiation. The entire time your foot's on the pedal, the patient's getting radiated. And then to take an uh, image, you'd have to take an exposure. So they're getting the fluoro dose plus an exposure dose. Now I use the low dose, which is the PEDS. It says pediatric barium single shot. If it just says barium single shot, that's adult dose. If it says pediatric barium single shot, that's pediatric dose. And I use three pulses per second. That means only three pulses of radiation per second are used instead of continuous fluoro. And then whatever you, when I put my foot off the, off the pedal, I can see an image on the image on the screen. I take a, hit a button and it saves that image. If I put my foot on the pedal and let off, I can hit another button and, and the entire Cine run will be taken. Whatever I had from that I might put my foot on the pedal to take it off, it will save that. So that really saves on dose. Plain films, the chest x-ray is most commonly ordered study. A KUB, this is for the residents. A lot of residents say the KUB is limited as it does not include the hemidiaphragms. They usually see this on an adult. A KUB does not include the hemidiaphragms. We get it on pediatrics because children are so small they'll always, almost always get the hemidiaphragm. But on an adult, if they order a KUB, it does not include the hemidiaphragm. It has to go below the pubic symphysis. So it's not inadequate, it's not uh, limited because that's what a KUB is. If they want to up free air, you do a two-view abdomen. The erect view doesn't care about the pubic symphysis, it cares about getting the lung bases and the hemidiaphragms. But the KUB is not for that. Uh, they will do bone images. Uh, for suspected child abuse and neglect. They'll do the bone survey. The bone survey consists of 21 images, 21 different images. You'll see a lot of times these patients will come from outside hospitals and they'll do like a baby gram and they'll maybe have like four images total for an entire bone survey. And the ACR does not like that. It tells you, you should do the humerus, the form, the hand. They'll do the, a lot of times, Willis Knight and Shumpert, they'll come here and they'll have one image of the entire arm the other image of the entire arm and one image of the entire legs, both of them on the same image. That's not what the ACR wants. And you can go to the, the ACR tells you what every study, what it should consist of. A shuntogram, when I was a resident, a shuntogram consisted of, we got nuclear medicine, radioactive material. The neurosurgeon came down. I helped him inject the reservoir and then we would image nuclear medicine over the skull and the peritoneum to look for ventricular activity and peritoneal activity. Nowadays, a shunogram is a frontal outer view of the skull, neck, chest, and abdomen, and all we can tell them is if there's a break or kink in the tubing. We can also see if there's a pseudocyst, a CSF pseudocyst around the intra-abdominal portion. If you see a big white area around the tube and bowel is being stretched out or pushed away, you have to really worry about a pseudocyst, then you do an ultrasound. Because they can get adhesions around the tip of the, of the uh, shunt and that can cause a pseudocyst. A scanogram is for a leg length discrepancy. They put that ruler between the, uh, between the legs and the image from above the iliac crest down to the bottom of the feet, and you measure the femur length, the tip fib length, the entire right lower extremity versus the left lower extremity, and that way they'll know if they're gonna do a bone lengthening procedure, how much to lengthen it, or if they're gonna give them a, a foot lift or a prosthesis to balance out the leg, that's what that is. Sinus series is, shouldn't be done anymore. For acute sinusitis, there's no reason to do it. 
chronic sinusitis, you should do a CT. CT, because you have to find the osteomedial complex. A sinus series, they should not do that. They still do every once in a while, but they, it, it really has gone away. Croup versus epiglottitis is a soft tissue neck. We get those. We get that for a foreign body also. So a chest x-ray, you, the first years, first years, you're going to be overwhelmed, uh, especially when other lectures. This lecture is not going to overwhelm you. The other lectures, some of you that you get, you see all these MRIs and CTs and all this stuff, and you hear the seniors and the people taking, Seema Sini will say, John, take this, because they're getting ready for the boards. And you, they will talk about all these findings and all these sequences, and you, you're looking at it like, I have no idea what I'm looking at. And then you start panicking, thinking, I'm an idiot. You know, I don't know anything about radiology. Nobody, know, it, unless you were already a radiologist from another country and you started your residency, if you were a medical student and you did an intern year and then you did radiology as a first year, you don't know anything. That's why you're doing your first year. You're learning. You're learning. You will be overwhelmed, but don't be. Just do your best to learn. Just you, you will never learn it all like that, but you will learn it over time. And just so realize that. You, the more studies you see, the better you will be. You will recognize normal variations that are normal. You can say, I saw that before, and Dr. Gay told me it was normal. And yet it looks like it was some pathology, but I showed you. And that variant book, Keats variant book that I have right next to my reading station, you've got to have that. They have it up in the call room. That is a must, especially for peds. But this, if this was you and I, we have a mediastinal mass, but this is a child. This is an asymmetric thymus. On the lateral view, it's going to be in the retrosternal space. Thymuses can look like many things. This is a, this is a unilateral sail sign, and this is the thymus. Here we have bilateral sail signs of the thymus. If this is nice and loose and around the edge, that's pneumomediastinum. If you see a bunch of black around it and you can really see it and it's standing out because of the lucency around it, that is pneumomediastinum. This is not thymus. This is a straight line. This is classic. If you see a straight line and it's white underneath it and you can see the right heart border, that is right lower lobe atelectasis. There's nothing else that's going to be, you know, right upper lobe atelectasis is a white thing coming here. Sometimes you will think it's the thymus, but it's not. Uh, atelectasis will go all the way to the edge and have a straight, straight margin, and that's right upper lobe atelectasis. They often will do this because the kid ingested something. This could be a coin, very well could be a coin. Most of the time it's a penny, but this could also be a battery, and batteries are not good to be in there. Nothing is good to stay in there because it can cause pressure erosions on the esophagus, and then can cause perforations later on strictures. We know on this view there's no chance that this is in the trachea. And the, ray, the way you know there's no chance this is in the trachea is here's the tracheal outline, the air column. If this was in the trachea, it would have to be within the confines of that. The trachea has a C ring cartilage, and the soft spot without the cartilage is in the back. So if this would have been an aspirated form body, it would have to be in this direction within the trachea. But they'll often get a lateral view, and is, I guess it's okay because I've seen like two or three coins that have been there, and, and that way they know. But here's the esophagus is behind the, the trachea, so you know this is the trachea, so this is in the esophagus. The three places that they're going to get stuck are at the thoracic inlet, at the, G, at the aortic knob level, and at the GE junction. Those are the three places that they're going to get stuck. Chances are when they come here and you get the x-ray and you see it here, it's not going to pass on its own. Rarely have I seen them do this. They do a follow-up in the morning and now it's in the stomach. <laughs> Think about it, the, the patient swallowed something. The mom realized the patient swallowed something. She had to get her shoes on, get the kid dressed, get her purse, get in the car, drive to LSU, find a parking spot, bring her kid, register in the emergency room. Then somebody had to say, oh, you swallowed something? They're, we'll do a check, we'll do an x-ray. So, and then they order it, and then the tech calls for them and they do it. So that's a long time. So chances are, if it's here, it's gonna get stuck. And the, the, they have to go get it. Because like I said, you don't want it to cause pressure necrosis and, uh, or perforate, or if it just caused the pressure necrosis, it could later on cause an esophageal stricture. And just one, one comment, if, if the foreign body is above the clavicular level, it's ENT, the team who will come to the ER and, and get that done to take the foreign body out. If it's below the clavicular level, it's the GI, the pediatric, uh, Dr. Chapa, uh, is the one who will come and, and, and do the endoscopy to take the foreign body out. That's, here is the most common cause of acute respiratory stress in a full-term infant. It's transient tachypnea of the newborn. TTN, that's a full-term infant. 
they will have normal to increased lung volumes, they will have pulmonary edema, and they often will have a pleural effusion. That's very important you know that. Normal to increased lung volumes, pulmonary edema, and pleural effusions. Transient tachypnea, within 24 to 72 hours, it will go away and it will be normal. That's why it's called transient. If after 72 hours it looks the same and the kid's still having problems, that's neonatal pneumonia. Neonatal, neonatal pneumonia can look just like transient tachypnea in the newborn. And what they think is failure to absorb the fetal fluid, uh, I told you all this stuff. They used to think that it was all because the C-section is increased risk of it. And that's because the baby didn't go through the birth canal, so the chest did not get compressed through the birth canal and express it. That is important, but also, how many people know of women that have elective C-sections and they know they're going to give birth on Monday the 21st? And so they never go into active labor. And if they never go into active, active labor, they never increase epinephrine in, their, in the woman's body. And epinephrine stimulates the potass, sodium potassium pump and all that, those uh, sodium channels to absorb the fluid. So if they never went into active labor, they never made the epinephrine, and that might be more important than not passing through the birth canal. The most common cause of respiratory distress in a preemie is formerly called hyaluronic membrane disease, and they changed it to respiratory distress syndrome, and now it's called surfactant deficiency disorder. These patients will have low lung volumes unless they're ventilated. If they're already ventilated, they might have normal lung volumes. But if they were not ventilated, they will have low lung volumes you will see a granular bilateral lung pattern. That granularity initially is microatelectasis. They do not have an associated pleural effusion. TTN has pleural effusions. These will not. If they have a pleural effusion, they could have, they could have a surfactant deficiency disorder and the neonatal pneumonia. But here you get a granular lung pattern, and that's a surfactant deficiency disorder. They give them surfactant to keep the alveoli that are open, open. It's not to open new ones, it's to keep the ones that are open, open. They give them high dose oxygen to oxygenate the alveoli that are, are open, and it's high dose oxygen. We breathe, the most common element in the air that we breathe is nitrogen, not oxygen. High dose oxygen is toxic to your, to your eyes, it can cause blindness, it's toxic to your lungs, but these little babies have to have it. They ventilate them either through a CPAP, a nasal CPAP, or they intubate them, and that is to try to open the new, the collapsed ones. And once the collapse ones start opening up a little bit, then the surfactant can work on them to make it open easier. This is an umbilical artery catheter. This is an umbilical venous catheter. When you cut the cord, this is very important. You know, there are three vessels in the cord. And the question is, are there two arteries or are there two veins? There are two arteries and one umbilical vein, two little eyes and one big round mouth. In the body, the big veins are bigger than the big arteries. And if you have to know that the umbilical artery loops down, you go into the belly button, they don't have to stick these little babies. They have access through the cut cord, the, the umbilical cord. They go through the, these, the artery and the vein, and that's the umbilical venous catheter and umbilical artery catheter. The umbilical artery loops down into the iliac and then goes into the aorta. And the aorta ends in two iliac arteries, so if you have two iliac arteries, you have two umbilical arteries. The umbilical vein goes directly up to the left portal vein, it skips the left portal vein, goes through the ductus venosus, into the IVC, and then into the right atrium. So there's only one umbilical vein. And if you could see the abdomen, if, if, I, if I was making a test for a residence, I would show just the ab below, uh, right above the belly button. And I would say, which catheter is this? And I would show one that's going directly up. That's the umbilical venous catheter. And I would show one that loops down and then goes up. That's the umbilical artery catheter because it goes down in the iliac. Three vessel cord, very important you know. Uh, I talked about this already. The more preemie they are, the more likely it's going to be uh, they're going to have this. If, you, if a baby is born and there's already pneumothoraces on their very first chest x-ray, you have to really worry that they had oligohydramnios in utero and they have in, where their lungs are not formed. And we just had one of those that this past week, had a multi-cystic plastic kidney on the right, had hydronephrosis on the left, probably from a post-urethral valve with, with reflux and obstruction. They used to call it hyaline membrane disease. We know now that neonatal pneumonia can cause hyaline membrane, does it, uh, cause hyaline membranes. Pulmonary edema can cause hyaline membranes. Uh, hemorrhage can cause hyaline membranes. So that's why they've changed it. Uh, when you've been on high dose oxygen for more than 30 days, it's bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is scarring of the lung. It's also now called chronic lung disease of prematurity. Okay, this is an abdomen. If you see a big tube, and you can see both walls of the tube, you know that's a feeding tube. 
It's a trans pyloric tube. It's not an NG tube. NG tube, you'll see one wall. I think they have a radiopaque marker on one side of the wall of the NG tube. Also, the NG tube does not end in a big white tip. NG tube just ends in the tube, and there's a side hole. The feeding tube does not have that side hole. The feeding tube has this big weighted tip, and you want it to be near the level of the ligament of trites. That's where you'd like it to be. This is a gastrostomy tube. This is a feeding tube. This is the stomach. Here, if you notice really, if you're good, you'll notice there's dilated bowel. Here I see the entire wall of the bowel. You can see the inside wall, you can see the outside wall, and this gas right here is not colon. This is pneumoperitoneum, and this is the regular sign or the double wall sign. Look here, this is lucency up here, and there's lucency here. This is pneumoperitoneum. You're gonna have to be able to recognize it on a, K, on a flat supine KUB because that's how our little NICU babies are. You're gonna have to be able to, re it's a lot easier to find on an erect view or decubitus decubitus study, but you're gonna have to be able to recognize it on the uh, supine images. Here, you can see the double wall really good. You should only be able to measure the inside wall. Like here, I can only measure the inside wall. I can't measure the outside wall. Be real careful calling the double wall sign in this area when you have bowel segments side by side because those are two walls that are adjacent. But over here, there's clearly, the you can see the entire wall of this segment of bowel. This is the ascending colon, which is retroperitoneal. This is intraperitoneal. And in the NICU, we, they get feeding intolerance. When they say feeding intolerance, that means they give them food and they either are throwing it up or there's a big residual, a lot of residuals. And when they see that, they worry about necrotizing enterocolitis and they stop feeding. <coughs> feeding does not cause NEC. Feeding makes it worse. Here we have elongated bowel. The bowel gas pattern should never look like this. This looks like a bunch of soap bubbles. And if you look real close, there's a little black line right here. Black line, black line. There's soap bubble appearance in here. This is pneumatosis intestinalis, which is a, not a disease. It's a radiographic sign. Pneumatosis intestinalis is not a disease. And the NICU is going to be NEC. Again, here's elongated, dilated segments of bowel. We have air in the wall. You can see these black lines in here. You can see black lines outlining this segment of the wall. We have soap bubble appearance on the, on the that's little tiny circle, air circles on the wall in front of it or behind it. And this is necrotized enterocolitis. This is a, a newborn that had nothing on the patient. This is small bowel that's coming out. You're gonna know gastroschisis versus emphalocele. It's very important that you, you guys know that. An emphalocele is, they're both abdominal wall defects. The emphalocele is a midline uh, bowel, abdominal wall defect with herniated liver, stomach, bowel, maybe colon, and it has a membrane, and the cord inserts into the membrane. It's a big midline abdominal defect. Gastroschisis is a small abdominal wall defect, usually on the right, much more than the left, not central, and it's usually just small bowel that's come out because it's a small hole. The liver can't come out, but small bowel can come out. And the question is that the board question or the ACR answer is which one is the best prognosis? Gastroschisis by far, because gastroschisis is associated with malrotation and maybe some bowel atresias, and that's it. They'll push it back in. If the baby doesn't have uh, uh, intestinal atresias, the baby's going to be okay. On phalloceles that you think, well, I want the membrane, the membrane covering it, that's good. No, it's not. On phalloceles have 50 to 75% chance of having chromosomal abnormalities. So over half of them to two-thirds of them are going to have chromosomal abnormalities. There are no chromosomal abnormalities in uh, gastroschisis. They can have congenital heart defects. They will have malrotation just like the gastroschisis one has, but they have all the other anomalies. So you'd much rather have a baby with gastroschisis than you would an emphalocele. And so if the, the board question was, which one has a membrane, which one's in the midline, that's emphalocele. Which one has a bigger uh, abdominal wall defect, that's an emphalocele. Which one is usually to the right of midline with a small defect, gastroschisis. Which one has chromosomal abnormalities, emphalocele. Here is, you go, I always go square, 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 box, box. And if you looked here, you would see a hemivertebrae, and you say, that one looks funny too. And then this is like a butterfly vertebrae. There's a separation in these two vertebral. And then look at this, another vertebral anomaly. So all they have to do is see that. And you tell them and what the OB, what the NICU will do. They will put their finger in the butt, make sure there's an anus. They will order an echo for a congenital heart defect. They'll put an NG tube down. This is the endotracheal tube. This is an NG tube. And they kept putting it here. It wouldn't go further. Putting it here wouldn't go farther. This is a classic TE fistula. 85%, 80 to 85% of TE fistulas, the upper esophagus ends blindly. 
So you put the NG tube down, it won't go anywhere. It'll stop right there and then it'll curl up. So that if, you, if it goes all the way to the stomach, chances are they don't have a TE fistula. They probably don't because the H type is a couple of percent and that's the third most common type and that one would go all the way down. The other ones would not go all the way down. So if you, if you go all the way down, chances are they don't have a TE fistula. Then they're going to order a renal anomaly, a renal ultrasound to look for renal anomalies, maybe horseshoe kidneys, maybe cross fusectopia, maybe pelvic kidneys, maybe absent kidneys, but that's what they're looking for. Then they're going to feel the arm, look at the arm, make sure the thumb is there and that there's two bones in the arm because they often have limb anomalies, especially the radius and the thumb might be hypoplastic or might be gone, not there at all, not developed. So Vactoral syndrome. Here, when I see this come across, I say SHIT because this is not good. Here you have healing posterior rib fractures. Here's healing posterior rib fractures. Here's a healing posterior rib fracture. You get lateral rib fractures. You get several rib fractures. And posterior rib fractures are very, very suspicious for child abuse. And so when I see that, I go, crap. Not only because I feel bad for the kid, but I know what's coming. That 21 image, one study, you spend 10, 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes on one exam, yeah. it pisses you off because it's 21 different exams under one, the bone survey. And they, the classic, the hallmark finding for child abuse is metaphyseal corner fractures. That's the hallmark. They're more likely going to have rib fractures. They're more likely going to have long bone fractures. But long bone fractures, if the kid can, is a toddler, they can get spiral fractures. They, that's what a toddler's fracture is, a spiral tibial fracture. But if the kid is two or three months old and they have a spiral fracture or a femur fracture, how'd they get it? They don't move. They don't move. Now, skull fractures are not really suspicious. They're suspicious in the fact there's a fracture, but good, loving, caring patients can accidentally drop their baby. And if you drop it on a hard floor, they'll get a skull fracture. So that's not necessarily child abuse. If the kid can roll and they roll off the couch onto a hard floor, they can get a skull fracture, but they will not get metaphyseal corner fractures. This is a metaphyseal corner fracture. Metaphyseal corner fractures are from yanking and twisting, yanking and twisting and shaking of when you're grabbing the legs or the arms. The most common places to get metaphyseal corner fractures are at the knees and the ankles. Those are the most common places to get metaphyseal corner fractures, and that's the hallmark. Hall hallmark is the one that is as highest suspicious of all, and that is it. Posterior rib fractures are, they try, they've done studies, they try to reproduce posterior rib fractures with CPR because they'll always say, well, they did CPR, the paramedics did CPR on my baby or my husband did, they can't reproduce posterior rib fractures. They can get anterior rib fractures, they can get lateral rib fractures, but not posterior. Scapula is a suspicious fracture. Spinous processes are suspicious fractures. Think about it, the spinous process has muscle on both sides of it, protecting it, and on the back of the chest, the ribs come like that, so the spinous processes are kind of protected by that. Sternum is a suspicious fracture. That takes a direct blow. A pelvic fracture, that's a significant trauma. A pelvic fracture, we see those in car accidents and big falls. So not the, ba you know, uh, the baby fell out of, you know, the, my bro the brother was playing with it and fell on him, unless the brother is very heavy. Uh, and that when you go, when you do, you gotta make sure you look for wormy and bones on the lateral view of the skull, because if there's wormy and bones, there could be osteogenesis imperfecta, which can cause fractures many fractures of different stages of healing. They could be born with already old healed fractures and healing fractures. But they're usually gonna have osteoporosis and they'll have wormy and bones. Also look at the knees and the ankles and the wrists for rickets. Look to see if they're splaying and fraying of the metaphyses of the growth plates widened because rickets will have fractures. This, if, if, if you called Carson or anybody, and you, any faculty and, you, and, and that knows, and you say, I've got the, the, they got a 12, 12 month old that every time they move their leg, they're crying. First thing that you think of is septic joint in the hip. If they say there's a five, six, seven, eight year old, nine year old male, four to five times more common than female with hip pain or knee pain, we think leg calf perthes. If they're obese, 12, 13, 14 year old, don't call Carson. If they're tw that's a joke. He, will, he would definitely have gotten it. 12, 13, 14 year old obese patients that have hip pain or knee pain, skiffy. That's how it goes. This is a five-year-old male, five, four to five times more common than females, that has right hip pain or a limp. This femoral head is more dense than this one. There's already a subcortical linear lucency. The earliest change that you get on a radiograph is soft tissue swelling, and that can be very difficult to see. 
the, then, so really, really the earliest change you're gonna see is a slightly smaller, dense femoral head. It'll be more white and a little bit smaller than the, than the normal side. That's not a really early change. The earliest changes are an MRI. They don't like to order MRIs. This is fine to order, but if you see it and they're suspecting AVN, tell them MRI is the best study. It'll detect the abnormal marrow signal way before an X-ray shows up. By the time you start getting this fragmentation and subcortical linear lucencies, that's not, that's subacute to older, but that's leg calf perthes. This next one is a 12-year-old obese male, minimally more common than female, and you can see that this is the, this is the metaphysis, this is the capital femoral epiphysis, and it is slipped posterior medially. There's a beak right here. There's, it, the ice cream falls off the ice cream cone posteriorly and medially. It'll always go posterior and medial. And this is called the line of climb when you draw your line up the femoral neck, and it should hit about this much of the head. If you draw your line up the head, up the femoral neck, it hits about that much of the head. Here, it barely touches the epiphysis. And the best view, this could easily be on your in-service, what's the best view to diagnose skiffy? It's the frog leg lateral view. That's the best view to diagnose skiffy. But sometimes all you get is that they'll order an AP view of the pelvis. The fractures, I always tell you all, I tell everybody, students, rub your finger on your bone, is it smooth or do you get a splinter? And here, you would get a splinter right here. You see that? You would get a splinter right here. And if you look close, there's a black line that comes all the way up through here like this. So it went through the growth plate. A Salter-Harris fracture involves a growth plate. And Salter-Harris 1 is skiffy. Skiffy is a Salter-Harris 1. It's a slippage. Uh, the growth plate on an x-ray is black. You can't see it. Fractures are black. You can't see it through the growth plate. So it's a growth plate injury, but it, there's no metaphyseal or, or epiphyseal fracture. Salter-Harris 2 is through the metaphysis into the growth plate. Salter-Harris 3 is through the epiphysis into the growth plate. Bless you. Salter-Harris 4 is through both. And there's a variant called a triplane for Salter-Harris 4 is when it goes through the metaphysis into the growth plate, scoots across the growth plate, and then goes through the epiphysis. That's a triplane, but it's still a Salter-Harris 4, and Salter-Harris 5 is a crush. I told you they do soft tissue necks. They'll do that for croup. They'll do that for a foreign body, and here is probably a coin. This is the voleculi. This is the piriform sinus. This is the other piriform sinus. This is the trachea right here. This is the level of the true cord. When you're doing swallowing studies with me or Dr. Carbo, if they penetrate down to here, that's deep penetration with coating of the cord. But if it goes below the level of the cord, that's aspiration. This is the hyoid bone. This is the area epiglottic fold. This is the epiglottis. This is the hard palate. This is the soft palate. Uh, above the soft palate is where you're gonna have your adenoids. The palatine tonsils are gonna be in this area. Here is what acute sinusitis would look like, but they shouldn't be ordering this. But you look for an air fluid level. Here is air fluid level. Uh, this is the right maxillary sinus, this is the left maxillary sinus. There's an air fluid level in here. This is the, F, the frontal sinuses, these are the ethmoid air cells. Look for the nasal turbinate. Uh, this is the superior orbital fissure. Remember V1, V2, V3, uh, where they go? They go through certain holes. V1 goes through the foramen rotundum. No, V1 goes through the superior orbital fissure. V Two goes through the foramen rotundum, V3 goes through the uh, foramen ovale. Pretty sure, pretty sure that's right. Is that correct, Carson? Pretty sure that's correct. V1 is through the superior orbital fissure, V2 rotundum, V3 foramen ovale. Here is epiglottitis. The area epiglottic fold is thickened. The epiglottis is thickened. These kids are very sick, very sick. High fever, drooling, uh, they look septic. It's usually H flu. It's on the, the downside, it's on the downhill because now children are vaccinated for the H flu vaccine. Uh, it could be in college kids because they didn't get the H flu vaccine. Uh, croup is the steeple sign. The steeple sign is of croup. These kids are not that sick. They get that barking cough, very low grade fever. Epiglottitis, high grade fever, usually bacterial. Croup, very low grade fever. Bark worse at night. It's usually the parainfluenza virus, it's the, it's the virus, it could be RSV. Uh, this is in a, uh, a little bit younger child, this is a little bit older child. Ultrasound, we use ultrasound a lot. Remember I told you ultrasound is no radiation. Here is a, a kid that has non-bilious vomiting. Uh, we do it, we do an ultrasound. We don't want to start with an upper GI. We want to look for hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. 
And what you want to do is measure the channel length and the muscle wall, the pyloric muscle wall thickness. The muscle wall of the pylorus is this black area. This is the mucosa. So this, you have to be very, very careful because a lot of times these kids, the stomach, the stomach is empty. And so they'll measure a channel length that'll be abnormal, but yet you see bowel gas flying through it and the muscle wall thickness is normal. They probably measuring part of the gastric antrum. So that's the case you want to give the kid Pedialyte to distend the antrum up so you know exactly where the antrum ends and where the pylorus starts. If you're really having a difficult time finding the pylorus on an ultrasound, if they're not really gassy and you really can't find it, it's going to be normal. It's going to be normal. These are really very prominent because their, their muscle's so thick. You measure the channel length and you measure the, the wall. You measure the wall in the, in the donut shot, the transverse image or the axial image. You measure this and here you measure it, uh, the length. And if the length is over 1.5 centimeters, it's abnormal. We used to use 1.75, Europe I think still does. We use over 1.5 is abnormal. Under, it's usually 1.1, 1.2, almost always 1.1, 1.2. If it's between 1.4, 1.5 is borderline, but over 1.5 is abnormal. The muscle wall is usually like 2, 2.5. If it's over 3.5, it's abnormal. If it's between 3 and 3.5, is borderline. Under 3 is normal. And like I said, you will not see fluid. If, if milk can't pass through it, the fluid and the air won't be passing through it either. And so usually these are not very difficult to, to see because they're so thick. They did have one that, uh, that they said that they called it abnormal and, and they operated on it and it was totally normal and uh, they had met, the antrum was collapsed so the channel length was real long but the muscle wall was normal and they said that they saw gas going through it. So if you see that, tell the tech, don't take these images of your, of your channel, let's give them Pedialyte and retake it and get rid of those measurements that are long. Here is a kid, a girl, uh, had not had a period. She, she, classic would be hirsutism, obese, acne, uh, amenorrhea. Many women have, many young, uh, young uh, women, older, uh, younger teenagers have this. They're not hairy. They're not obese. They are amenorrheic. This is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, it, it's you, a lot of times the the girl or the the tech will. We'll say, have you ever had a, they'll say, have you ever had sex? And the girl will say no, and so they won't even try to do an individual on them. If the kid's 12, I understand. If the kid's 16 or 17, or if it's a woman that's 20, we really do need to do individual because transabdominal, the ovaries can look normal, especially if they have any of the characteristics, one of them being obesity. It's hard for ultrasound to go penetrate obesity, and now you're so far away from the ovaries because it, there's adipose tissue, and then you have to go through the abdominal wall and then down into the, to the ovary. You do endovaginal, you're right next to the ovary. And I've seen this in this, in fact, this case, the transabdominal imaging you would have called normal. Especially in a teenage girl, the, kid, the ovaries are not big initially. They're not big. And they're not big cysts. They're small, numerous follicles. They used to say that more, like, they used to say like seven or more. Then they changed it to maybe 13 or more. I think it's now like 17 or 21 or more meaning you have tons of these little follicles and they're classic around the periphery. Have you ever seen those old rotary dial phones? We all, I grew up with it. Dr. D grew up with that. That's what we had, the rotary dial phone. This is what it looks like. It looks like this. This is classic polycystic ovarian syndrome. Numerous, numerous follicles around the periphery. So this is endovaginal. Endovaginal, you put it into the vagina, we let the, the girl or the woman put it in her own, and then the tech takes it from there, and then you, you're right next to the ovaries. You can see beautifully. You avoid all the adipose tissue. Here, if you see, this is very important, we don't have Jackie anymore, but if you see multiple cysts of various sizes that do not communicate, it's very important. Do they communicate or do they not communicate? If they do not communicate, it's multi-cystic plastic kidney. And if they communicate, it's hydronephrosis. And if it's hydronephrosis, urology might be able to save whatever function is left in that kidney by either doing a nephrostomy or putting a double J ureteral stent in it because you're gonna relieve that pressure. If there are cysts that do not communicate, it's multi-cystic spastic kidney, that kidney is not gonna be working. They do have some that have like a partial multi-cystic spastic kidney. 
They have some that have bilateral multicystic spastic kidneys. If you have bilateral multicystic spastic kidneys, the baby never made urine. The bladder, the uh, OB ultrasound, they never saw, uh, they never saw the bladder. Oligohydramnios, the lungs never form. They have pneumothoraces. Those babies die. The most common cause, the most common association with a multicystic spastic kidney is a contralateral UPJ stenosis. So if you have a multispastic kidney on the right, you really need to look at the left kidney to see if they have a UPJ stenosis or worse yet, a multicystic spastic kidney on that side. And so this is very important. This kid is not functioning. If they only have one that's this way, the kid can live a normal life because you only need one kidney. And this kidney often will scar down and will be a little nubbin of a kidney. Here is what portal venous gas would look like on a static grayscale image. But under real time, these would be little white bubbles that you just see flying through here. If they ask you on a test, which gas is more central in the liver and which one's more peripheral in the liver, portal venous gas or biliary gas? Biliary gas is more central. Portal venous gas is more peripheral. They could ask you that on a test. On ultrasound, you would see these little bubbles, white things, little white circles just flying through these portal veins. And, and that's not good. That could be, uh, you know, that's a bad sign. Here we have testicles. This is the left testicle, this is the right testicle. Uh, we had, uh, it was on call or somebody was on call and the tech hadn't come out for the testicles. Was it you or was it Bhavna this weekend? Uh, was it you or was it Nor? Time, you know, they say time is brain, time is testicle. If you have a torsion, you have eight hours, six to eight hours to save that testicle. If it's not within that six to eight hour period, they can't salvage that testicle. So it's important, trust me, girls and ladies, men, I'm sorry, girls, y'all aren't girls, y'all are women. A man wants two testicles. They want two. They can put a prosthesis in there, but you, we want two. And so if, there's a, if it's torsed, we want to be able to save it. So that case of the tech not coming out, that's not good. Because you gotta think about it a lot of times, especially on peds, that bad, uh, adult men, they're gonna come in. A kid has to tell their mom and convince their mom that they're really hurting enough to have the mom bring them to the emergency room. That's been a problem. They had a, the kid cried all day long about it, and she said, oh, you're gonna be fine, and the next day he was still crying, so she brought him in. 24 hours, that kid, the test was dead. So we put color on it. We wanted, and then we put uh, spectral waveforms to see the arterial flow and the venous flow. And if you see flow in it, that's good. But it still could be, it could have torsed, and then it could have detorsed. If you see flow around the periphery of the testicle but nothing in it, that's a torsion. You can get capsular uh, color and still have a torsed testicle. If, and just realize that if you see flow in it, but it might be a little bit dampened and the, the kidney, the, 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 the testicle might be a little darker, hypochoic, that could have torsed and detorsed, torsed and detorsed. So make sure urology gets to see it. In this case, this is very easy. This is the side that hurt. You know there's no way this is torsed. This is epididymorchitis. And if it's, this is the epididymis, that's really hot. Real, this looks like it's on fire. The testicle is very vascular. The epididymis is very vascular. This is epididymorchitis. If it's just the epididymis that's very uh, vascular and the testicle's normal, it's epididymitis. If it's just the testicle just, that's hypervascular and the epididymis is not, that's orchitis. This is, a lot of times, this is due to chlamydia or a venereal disease. So that, you have to realize that. And make sure that you look for, a lot of times they'll have a hydrocele, uh, so you look for hydrocele's. But this was epididymorchitis. They might ask you this on the test, it, it, which is the first to go in torsion? Is it the testicular venous flow or the testicular arterial flow, first years? Venous, the venous flow will go first. So you might see arterial waveforms, but no venous waveforms anywhere. So that, that just realize that. And uh, also you wanna look above the testicle to see if you can see the spermatic cord and have them put color on it. And if you see little spirally looking things, that's not good. You do wanna do that also if they're worried about a varicocele. You want them to look at the cord and you want them to the patient to Valsalva. Bear down like they're having a bowel movement. Little babies is great. The mom is gonna put the pacifier in the mouth and say, no, don't do that. Let them cry. Crying is a Valsalva maneuver. We do this several times a week, ventricular ultrasounds. This is in preemies. They get germinal matrix hemorrhages. This is, uh, they use the anterior fontanelle. The anterior fontanelle closes anywhere between six months and 18 months. 
The posterior fontanelle closes between one and three months. So they use the anterior fontanelle. They don't go through the sides in the, in the skull. They go through the anterior fontanelle, and then they angle back, they angle forward, then they turn the transducer, angle to the left, angle to the right. And what we're looking for is hemorrhage. Grade one is, this is the sagittal image. This is the head of the caudate. This is the thalamus. This is part of the temporal lobe. This is the head of the caudate thalamus. This is the caudothalamic notch. If you had a round ball of whiteness, and this was not here, a round ball of whiteness right here, that's grade one hemorrhage. Grade one hemorrhage is at the caudothalamic notch. Grade two, in this case, is when it goes into the ventricle, but the ventricle is not dilated. You gotta realize, you gotta know where the choroid plexus lives. The choroid plexus comes through the frame in a row, goes through this right here at the, ca at the caudothalamic notch, and then goes along the floor of the lateral ventricle to the body, to the atrium or the trigone, that's where the body meets the occipital horn and meets the temporal horn, and then it goes into the temporal horn. Cori plexus does not go in the frontal horn, does not go in the occipital horn. So this, does that not look the exact same whiteness as that? Looks the exact same. And if you didn't know that Cori plexus doesn't live here, you would think that's Cori plexus. That's hemorrhage. Cori plexus never lives here, never lives here. If you had white right back here, that's blood. Cori plexus does not live there. So the frontal and the occipital horns, they don't live. Here on the, on the coronal image, you can see this is really asymmetric. This is the third ventricle. This is the frame of Monroe. This is the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. This is chori plexus. I mean, this is hemorrhage. This is the corpus callosum. Connects the left brain to the right brain. CT, I told you CT is fantastic, but radiation. And radiation is important. And there are going to be radiologists sued over ra radiation. And, and how are we going to prove that that cancer wasn't caused by radiation? You're going to get expert witnesses say, say that it was, even though we know you can't definitely tell. But if you did unnecessary CTs, the clinician will get sued and the radiologist will get sued and we'll probably all lose. But, that, but if you did your best to say, I tried to tell them to do an ultrasound, tried to tell them to do an MRI, they kept ordering this, you know, I did, I, you still might lose, but at least you try. CT is best for trauma. CT is best for abdominal trauma. Uh, is for some congenital anomalies, for infections, and for tumors, especially uh, soft tissue tumors, brain tumors, spine tumors. Here is a CT of a, they, this person, the, you see the eyeball and the lens is pointing back where they're looking behind them. There's no way this person could see behind them because the optic nerve is to totally gone. This was not a child, but this was an adult, and it was brought from uh, Alexandria, and there was a cup around the eye to hold the eyeball and so nothing else goes. But this, this person lost his eye because the optic nerve is gone. Here's the problem with metal on CT. They cause a star type of artifact. And you can imagine, like right here, can you see this medial rectus, uh, this lateral rectus very well? No. Can you see the inside of the orbit right here very well? No, because there's these BBs in here. But they still will do it. Here, this is a tension pneumothorax. You would never order chest, a chest CT for a tension pneumothorax. You'd order a chest X-ray. And tension pneumothorax, if you see one and you're on interventional, you don't have time to call for someone to put a chest tube in. You put a, you, you might, all y'all might have those little valves down there, but if you didn't, all you had was a syringe, a needle, put it in the second intercostal space, intercostal space at the mid clavicular level, put it in there, relieve it, and then put a chest tube in. Students, if you guys have one, you don't have time to call surgery to put them in. These patients can die. You need to put a needle in that second intercostal space. You don't have time for the surgeon to come. If it's a, the way you know it's a tension pneumothorax, then a simple pneumothorax on the right, the heart and the, and the mediastinum and the trachea will shift towards the right, the hemidiaphragm will come up. You lose volume on that side. If it's a tension pneumothorax, that hemidiaphragm will be depressed and maybe even inverted. The heart will be shifted away from it. That's just all signs of tension pneumothoraces. For uh, uh, neck abscess or pharyngeal abscess, they'll often do the soft tissue neck that I told you about. The problem is a lot of little little children, especially if they're crying, they're taking an expiration, they have their head flex, that retropharyngeal space can be huge. It can never be huge in us and be normal, but in a little baby, it can be. So a lot of times they'll have to go to CT, and here was a, a abscess, this, ab, this darker area, and it extended here and sh shifted the uh, trachea to the right. Why, on, they'll use contrast too, and a lot of times you'll see the enhancing uh, rim. I don't think there was contrast here, but. Why is the thyroid, if there's no contrast, uh, Hunter, why is the thyro thyroid white? Yes, yes. That's the problem with uh, pregnant women. There's a concern, you, you inject 
for a woman, a pregnant woman, you inject them with iodine and a contrast, which we do, it can cross the blood-brain barrier. The little baby's thyroid could pick it up, and theoretically, the baby might become hypothyroid because now, you see what I'm saying, it's not taking the iodine. It took up the contrast. So, but if you have to do it, you have to do it. This is, we had Dr. Uh, GT's lecture on Wednesday showed the medulloblastoma. This is usually where the medulloblastoma is. Posterior fossa, that one was in the cerebrum, but on the far right side or left side, I forget which side. This is classic, midline, uh, hyperdense. There's no contrast, it's hyperdense. The image is yellow because it was an actual film, and old film turned yellow because of oxi oxidation. But this is a necrotic, hyperdense, posterior fossa mass in a kid that caused hydro hydrocephalus. This is a medulloblastoma. It's a horrible tumor. Like I think it was Carson said, what would you do next? You would MRI the spinal cord and the whole spine to look for drop metastasis. Medulloblastoma loves to seed in the CSF. Here you have this huge mass, and the, you, you have to decide where it is. Here it's displaced the left kidney anteriorly. Here's the spleen. That's the stomach. Here is the left kidney. That's the aorta. That's the inferior vena cava. These are portal veins. Here's the aorta. Here's the kidney. You still, you, it, this theoretically could be in the retroperitoneum behind the kidney. But when you see this, this is the burr, the beak sign. When you have the beak sign, you know that's coming from that organ. So this is a huge renal mass. And in one to eight year olds, Wilms tumor is the favorite tumor for a, for a kidney tumor. Less than a year of age, Wilms tumor is rare. Rare means it happens, but not often. The most common solid renal mass in a newborn or an infant, newborn is less than 30 days, infants less than one year, is a mesoblastic nephroma. That's a benign tumor, but they'll still take it out because later on there's a chance of malignant degeneration. Uh, just like any, pretty much any solid renal mass in an adult comes out because the, it's cancer until you t pathologist says it's not. But this will have to be differentiated between this and what other tumor. The most common palpable solid mass, abdominal mass in a newborn is neuroblastoma. Hydronephrosis is the most common uh, palpable mass, but it's not solid, and it's not a mass, it's hydronephrosis. Multicystic dysplastic kidney is the second most common palpable abdominal mass. The third most common abdominal palpable abdominal mass is neuroblastoma, not this, but neuroblastoma. The most common solid palpable abdominal mass is neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma is usually gonna be in the adrenal, but it can be anywhere in the sympathetic chain. Do you remember, students, the organ Azuka candle? Did y'all learn that? You never heard of that? It's a sympathetic, it's part of the sympathetic chain right near the IMA takeoff. So it could be anywhere in the, in, the pair, in the sympathetic chain. The best prognosis for neuroblastoma is if the kid is less than one year of age and it's in the adrenal. If it's out of the adrenal, worse prognosis. If the kid's more than a year, worse prognosis. But you're gonna, you are definitely on your boards, uh, in services, you have to know the difference between the two. Neuroblastoma versus Wilms. This is usually in the adrenal or anywhere in the sympathetic chain. This is from the kidney. The age, I told you best prognosis of this less than a year. Kid, the Wilms tumor is classic. Two to three year old mom feels a belly mass and they take it as a Wilms tumor, but it's one to eight years old for a Wilms tumor, one to eight. The calcifications, that's why on, new, on these x-rays on all the babies, I always go white calcification, white calcification, white calcification, white calcification, white calcification. I'm looking anywhere, in the, especially in the upper abdomen where the adrenal might live because up to 70% of neuroblastomas calcify, only 10% of Wilms tumor will calcify. This thing is so slow. It's stippled calcifications in neuroblastoma curvilinear in uh, Wilms tumor, if they do. Neuroblastoma is bilateral, 10% Wilms is less than 10%. Uh, neuroblastoma loves to cross the midline. Wilms may cross the midline. You got to know about the, th think about it. This is simple if you think about it. What does it do to the renal vein? Neuroblastoma is an adrenal tumor. Adrenal is outside the kidney, so it will encase the renal vein and the IVC. Wilms tumor is in the kidney. It will grow into the kidney, grow into the renal vein, grow into the IVC, and go into the right atrium. So it will invade the renal vein and the IVC. Where do the metastasize to? I asked the students that this morning. Neuroblastoma's favorite place to go is the bone lymph nodes and then the liver. Wilms' favorite place is the lung and the liver. Wilms tumor loves to go to the lung, so chest x-ray or CT chest. Chest x-ray, but they'll or sometimes order CT. Follow up with chest x-ray and then every once in a while get a CT. Uh, neuroblastoma loves to go to the bone. It causes moth-eaten black holes in the bone. This is associated with congenital heart defects, a ganglionosis of the bowel. This is associated with beckwith wiedemann syndrome, with aniridia, sporadic aniridia, renal or genital anomalies, hemihypertrophy, and so 
they'll say patient with Beckwith Wiedemann and they'll order an abdominal ultrasound. Especially if it's a little kid, you want to rule out a hepatoblastoma because they get that hepatoblastomas, they get nephroblastomatosis, which are multiple solid masses around the periphery of the kidneys, and Wilms tumor, which is nephroblastoma. Uh, neuroblastoma. 95% will have an elevated urine VMA, so they need to get this test if they really suspect uh, neuroblastoma. If it metastasizes to the skin, it's called the blueberry muffin syndrome if neuroblastoma metastasizes to the skin. MRI is fantastic for CNS anomalies, extremity trauma, AVN tumors, infection, difficult chest and abdomen cases, and MR angiograms. Uh, this is a MRI of the brain. It's a T1 that we've got. Uh, the CSF is black. Here we have the faults. Here we have the part of the, uh, the cerebellum and the brain stem. Do you see any cortex? No. This is not severe, massive hydrocephalus because in that case, you should see a little thin rim of cortex that is getting squashed by the hydrocephalus. This is hydranencephaly. This is due to in utero insult, vascular insult on the internal carotid arteries. So the internal carotid arteries had a vascular insult and they occluded. So now the majority of the cerebrum will be gone, it's gone. What part of the cerebrum can still be there? The more posterior inferior part of the, the occipital horn, because you remember the vertebral arteries in, make the basilar artery, and what's the very last branch of the basilar artery? The posterior cerebrals. Posterior cerebrals supply the posterior uh, inferior portion of the cerebellum, of the, of the uh, occipital horn, so you might have a little bit of that because the vertebral arteries are there, but this is hydranencephaly. Here is an MRI, it's beautiful, showing you a myelomeningocele. This is not a common place for it. Com most common is at the lumbosacral juncture. But here you actually have nerve roots going through this little defect. And that's important. If they thought that there was like maybe a little soft tissue tumor here and they did a biopsy on it, you'd be biopsying nerve roots. So that's not good. Uh, this is beautiful. ACL, uh, medial meniscal injuries, uh, ligament injuries, MRI is so beautiful. This is the normal knee. The quadriceps tendon, this is a, the patella. The patella is the largest sesamoid in the body. This is the patellar tendon. Here's the ACL. You normally only see the ACL in its entirety, usually on one image. The PCL, you rarely see it on one image all by itself. You have to go on multiple. But it'll look like this. It'll look like this. ACL is a straight line. They'll usually have to do special oblique views to get that ACL. As, in, as opposed to this other side, look at the ACL is gone. There's no black intact fibers here. That's a complete ACL tear. Here is what leg calf perthes avian of the hip could look like on an MRI. You have abnormal signal. This, might, this would be much more positive and earlier than a plain film would be. Here, if you're worried about an abscess versus osteomyelitis, you can do pre and post contrast imaging. And here, you, if you were going to try to get a culture, here you'd be able to know this is, this is a draining wound. You have no problem getting culture. But this is the pus pockets. This is just inflammatory soft tissues. There's not going to be any pus in here. It's just all reactive inflammatory tissues. But this is pus, that's pus, that's pus, that's pus. And it looks like it's draining out of the heel right now. And I will end and I'll finish next time on nuclear medicine and fluoro. So uh, this was, all this is is to just give you an overview. I will go over each anatomic system on a, their own lecture and uh, just to get you excited about pediatric uh, radiology. You got to realize uh, on the in-service, there's a ped section. There really should be maybe four sections, one section, four sections of radiology. One should be adult, one should be child, one should be uh, nuclear medicine because that's its own, and then interventional.